Hello! Thank you very much for joining me again. Today we're going to be looking at depth of field. Depth of field, the long and short of it, is how much of your image is in focus. So, front to back, what is the area of focus there? Is it just the person? Is it the person going all the way to the background? That's what we're going to be looking at today. And specifically, we're going to be looking at how to get nice shallow depth of field, or bokeh, or background blur, using equipment such as smartphones, and smartphones that don't have some kind of portrait mode. So we're going to break it down into three components, of which I'll go through in further detail at the back end of the video. So if you're not too interested in how these things actually work and you just want to get a real sense of it, you don't have to watch it. Uh, but the three components are aperture. The aperture is the size of the opening in the lens. Focal length, that is how long or short a lens is. And then the relative distance from your camera to your subject and then from your subject to your background. This is the main thing, relative distance is what we're going to be focusing on today to allow you to achieve those nice, shallow, depth of field looks using something like a smartphone. Okay, so now we're going to do a bit of proof of concept. Um, this is all about relative distance, and so when I say relative distance, I don't just mean from your camera to the subject, but I also mean from your camera to the subject and then to the background. So we're going to use this nice little diagram here that I've drawn. So what we've got, we've got three scenarios of relative distance. We have scenario one, which is the camera is quite close to the subject, and the subject is quite far away from the background. Scenario two, which is the cardboard relative to the computer, which we'll get in touch with in a moment, is uh, the camera is quite far away from the subject, but the subject is really close to the background. We've then got scenario three, which is somewhere in the middle. But um, that's neither here nor there, really. But the main things we want to focus in on scenario two. So we are presently in scenario two. So if I zoom in, you can see that the edge of the cardboard and then the edge of the computer are relatively in focus. Now, if I pick up my bit of paper and I start moving away, do you see how suddenly, apart from the autofocus, uh, it becomes very, very out of focus very quickly. This is how we achieve it, and it's all about the distance of your subject relative to the background. The closer you can get your subject to your camera, and the further you can get it away from the background, will result in lovely background blur, as you can see here. Be like the smiley man. So I've got my smartphone, and this is gonna be quite a crude operation, because I'm kind of using both hands at the same time, but we'll roll with it. So I'm going to use this as an example. So I'm going to get my smartphone nice and close to what I want to photograph. And as you can see, the closer I get, if you look in the top right hand corner, that top lens there is getting really out of focus very quickly. So if I take a photo, that is the subject really close to the background, but at the same time, my camera is also really close to my subject. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my subject slightly further away. So I'm going to, oh, hey Bert. So I'm going to take my subject and I'm going to move it closer. Well, closer to me, further from the background. And now, do you see how that background is very, very out of focus now? So this is how we do it. So in summary, that is the easiest way you can get nice out of focus backgrounds with your smartphone and just using a standard smartphone nothing with portrait mode obviously you've got portrait mode that's a different kettle of fish altogether um, things to bear in mind one this is a wide angle lens this is the equivalent of a 29 millimeter lens that is very wide um, and that does make it difficult to get nice background blur so you do need to bear that in mind um, the other thing that you need to kind of think about when you are doing these compositions is actually what's in your background is your background aesthetically pleasing is there a lot of junk in there is it stuff is it just a load of cobble junk like what yeah, a load of random sort of things that are like are behind me that are actually going to distract from the image or is it actually pleasant to look at? Things that I find work really nicely are things like trees, grass, that kind of stuff that will kind of just melt away a little bit. Um, just things to bear in mind. So when you are doing your composition, not only think of your foreground, but do think of your background as well of what's actually in it, because there are going to be things like if you're taking photo of the building scenario earlier, that building is still going to be in that background and it is not going to melt away as nicely as you'd like. So do bear that in mind when you're doing that. So now we move on to science and physics because physics is cool, kids. Um, so we're going to talk about the other two components of 
what make up your depth of field. So you've got your aperture and you've got your focal length. Now an aperture is the opening of the lens and how open or closed that is. So I'll give you an example. This here is one of my favorite lenses I own. This is a 50 millimeter f1.4. This is a Nikon lens and this has, you can pretty much see straight through it. This has a large aperture. Um, you've got this little ring on the back and on other lenses which we control by the camera. But what you can do is you can open it and you can close it. The wider open it is, the more light it lets in. It also doesn't cause diffraction. Diffraction is what happens when the light is bent in a certain way. So think of the Pink Floyd album cover. Uh, that is diffraction going through and being affected by glass and being affected by that. So the, sl the smaller you make this lens, or the smaller you make the opening, the more light is being diffracted. As a result, this physically bends the light and causes more of the image to be in focus. Um, if I give you the example here, you can see how on this top one here we've got a very wide open lens so you can see the light is just passing straight through it this gives us a very shallow depth of field this is stopped down to f22 um, and i'll talk through the numbering system in a moment um, this what happens is it gives you a very small opening so you can see it's almost a pinhole and as a result the light is being bent massively out of shape and this causes more of your background to be in focus or more of your shot to be in focus what's called a large depth of field, which is captured by a small aperture, comes in very handy. So think if you're picturing, if you're taking photos of buildings or if you're doing street photography where you just want to set a certain focal length and just take photos and not have to think about it. That is also how disposable cameras and pinhole cameras work is they have a very small aperture and one focus so that that way you can pretty much guarantee get everything in the shot. So that is how aperture works. The other point is focal length. So we can see here, so I've got two lenses. I've got again my 50 millimeter and I've got a 400 millimeter lens. This I use for shooting animals and wildlife, zoo life, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is your typical lens and this will normally shoot about the same as the human eye. So this will see roughly about the same as what the human eye sees, which is great. I love 50 millimeter lens. Uh, it just allows me to kind of get what what I see is what I get essentially. So this is when you're shooting things really far away. Now, with a focal length, the focal length is not how big or small the lens is. Obviously, a longer focal length will result in a longer lens. But what it actually is is the point where the light converges are after the lens. So it's actually a distance away that the light will meet. So think of when you're doing science lessons and you've got your glasses, how your glasses will focus onto a certain point of your eye to allow you to see properly. That is what a focal length is. It's just on the outside of the lens. So we can see if I take a 50 millimeter lens and a 200 millimeter lens, this is the point of convergence here. This is where our convergence point is. And then after that, that's where our focus area is. And we can see that there's quite wide in comparison. Next to it, I've got a 200 millimeter lens. You can see that it goes up, almost goes off the page before it actually converges, and that is will result in what's called a shallow field of view. So a field of view is actually what you can see relative to the background. So this has a similar effect. So when we talk about like distance from the subject to the lens, it's all about perspective. So when you're using a wider focal length, the way you can get around it is by moving closer to your subjects. Therefore, your subject becomes bigger relative to the rest of the image. It's all about perspective, and this affects your depth of field. Um, so we can see here, on our focal length, that we've got quite a wide area here. Um, so this will give us more in the background behind me that's in the shot. If I was shooting a portrait and I just wanted someone's face, I would use a longer lens to get rid of that and essentially shrink what's behind me, I would also be stood further away, which would allow that change in perspective. And perspective combined with focal length is what will kind of allow you to eliminate backgrounds. Um, one important thing to note as well is how focal length and aperture behave dependent on each other as well. So I'll give you an example. So like I said, this 50 millimeter f1.4, this has an incredibly shallow depth of field. However, your aperture is depend, will give you a different depth of field depending on what your focal length is. So when I'm using this on its widest possible setting, this gives me a ridiculously small area that is actually in focus. That could be the difference from one eye being in focus and one eye being out of focus if your subject is slightly at an angle. That is how shallow it is. However, this is a 400mm f5.6 lens. This has a large front element, that's how it gets the 5.6, and I'll talk about that in a moment. 
but because of its focal length, although it is significantly is significantly smaller in theory in comparison to the 50mm from how much light it lets in, it still gives you a ridiculously shallow depth of field. So the same, if I'm shooting in a zoo, and I'm shooting animals in the face, again, if I'm shooting this wide open, this will be the difference between one eye being out of focus and one eye being in, in focus, depending on what the animal's facing, or like the bridge of their nose being in focus, but then the rest of their face being ridiculously out. So you've got to be very careful when you're shooting these really shallow depth of fields.